Everybody, welcome back to the show, Science, Facts, and Fallacies, episode 221. My name is Cameron English. I'm your host, as always, joined again by Dr. Liza Dunn. Liza, so nice to see you again. How are things? Here, yeah, things are great. Very, very good. I am uh, excited to talk about some science. It's the end of the week, and that's just a fun way to end the week, as far as I'm concerned, is to talk about uh, cool stories that have been in the news. So let's jump right into this. First up, new wave of neuroscience tech companies experimenting with controversial brain-focused products. Next up, rejecting the luxury green beliefs of the privileged West, why developing countries are rebelling against Greenpeace's anti-technology policies. And finally, AI helps discover new drug that kills antibiotic-resistant superbug. Really cool stuff, as always. Again, with you here, we get to dive into some of this medical stuff that we don't always... Uh, don't always jump into. So it's really cool here. So this first story, this is by a journalist named Michael Nolan, originally writing for Undark. And he's talking about these innovations in neuroscience, these new technologies that can measure brain activity in ways that were not common even just a few decades ago. This really sort of started in the early 1990s, but it's sort of exploded in these last, last few years. Now, these were originally these technologies outside of a, like a medical context. They were of most interest to uh, biohackers, you know, these people that yep. are trying to enhance their their brain activity or improve their focus or whatever. Like all the stuff on an energy drink can, like pe <laughs> that's what people <laughs> wanted from this technology. They want a hat that'll do that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So if you need to like focus, they want a little right something that'll help you you know, and enhance your concentration and so forth. But the problem here, or at least the potential problem, I should say, is that you have uh, tech companies like Meta and Snapchat and Instagram, all of these companies, they they profit by aggregating a bunch of your data, you know, how old you are, where you're from, your buying habits, what you like, what you don't like, and selling it to third parties, mostly companies that want to sell you products and services. So they do that by looking at your web history and like every bit of information you give them on Facebook, for example, they use it to sell more advertising to you. You're the product essentially. So these technologies are potentially very, very lucrative for them because if they can track in a certain sense, what's going on in your brain, like how do you, how do you react? Like at a, I guess at a neurochemical level, when you see a certain advertisement for a particular product, they can use this to more effectively target ads at you. So this is great for them. And maybe if you want to be, I, I would say, kind of Pollyanna-ish, you could say it's great for you too, because now you get to like, you get to the products you want faster, right? So maybe that's one benefit. But of course, the concern is privacy, because now these companies, and, and it's a lot of different industries. So like even the gaming industry wants to use this to, to integrate um these technologies into their platforms for video gaming and for um, virtual reality. Like this is a big thing that Meta, Facebook is getting into. So this is a problem for people that are concerned about privacy. And we can talk a little bit more about that, but, but that's just sort of where the story takes off, right? These technologies are not ready for prime time yet. They're not in widespread use, but, but these, these companies, these tech companies have already invested billions of dollars in this. So they see this, as a viable option in the coming decades. So with that, jump in here. What do I think? So I think um, this is all very, very, very interesting. We all get kind of hesitant about novel technologies. And this is one of the things that we get hesitant about because we think about the potential negative ramifications of that. Um, and I agree that there are potential negative ramifications you don't want companies reading your mind um, and being able to use that information to, you know, uh, make you influence your behavior and things like that. Now, that said, if I had a child that was paralyzed because of a car accident and I there, there was the potential for that technology to be able to help him or her move, that would be a really huge benefit um, of that kind of technology. Um, or if I had a person who had some a bad stroke or something like that, and they were able to move um, the side of their body that they hadn't been able to move before, or if, they, if it helped them actually speak, 
right? Because one of the bad side effects of stroke is if you get a stroke on the right side, of, on the correct side of the brain, on usually on the left, um, you can lose your whole ability to speak. You can know what you want to say. All your thoughts are trapped in your head and you can't get it out. And that is really, really, it's called aphasia. And it's very, very difficult for people to deal with. So that kind of technology, if you can translate that into actually a therapeutic benefit in, a, in terms of a medical sense, that offers great promise. And I do know, personally know, people who are working on um, uh programs like that that have actually helped paralyzed people move and have helped um, you know uh, other people with devastating neurologic illnesses actually have a much better quality of life so I hate to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to technology like this because I think it's got great potential and yes it has some downsides now one of the things that they mentioned in this article is there's not really a great regulatory apparatus around it and I think that that's really important too we need Need to have the smart regulation around these technologies in order to make protect the consumer from the kind of thing that you're talking about there. But we don't want to limit the potential of really giving people um, a great uh, opportunity to, to walk again or to, uh, you know, be able to speak again. These are huge things that we take for granted in our everyday lives. And so I, I think that the, on balance, um, the jury's still out about the potential of this uh, of this technology, but I think that there are um, really promising um, features of it as well. One thing I'm hopeful about, and again, who knows, right? I can't predict the future, but one thing I'm, I'm hopeful about is that there will be solutions that emerge in the marketplace. So when it comes to privacy, just more generally online, you can use encrypted email, you can use encrypted yes. messaging services, you can use uh, VPNs, you can use all of these different applications that block ads and so forth. So I'm less confident in the federal government figuring out how this works and then that's true too. Yeah. Th then properly regulating it. You know, that's a problem because the reality is, is that people in government are there for decades and they're usually old and they don't, <laughs> you know, and they don't, they're usually lawyers, so they don't have, they don't understand the medical side of it. Yeah. You know, and and the, the classic example is Mark Zuckerberg testifying in front of Congress. And I forget who it was, but some congressman who's like 170 is like, so how do you make money again? And he's like advertising. Right. <laughs> so they don't even they don't even understand how the business model works. That's right. But, but I could see, especially because a lot of people that are in tech tend to be. And again, this is a generalization, but a lot of people, they tend to be sort of libertarian leaning and really interested in their autonomy. So that maybe that's the hope, right? Is that you could get some sort of FDA regulated device or software that could do the things that you're talking about. Well, whereas on the consumer side, there will be solutions that could prevent the abuse of this. Maybe I guess. That's exactly just, right. just Yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly right. Um, I think that you know. There, there, there you flip sides to each side, you know, each side of a new technology, you know, when you've got, when you've got, you know, lights on and electricity on, you're, there's a risk of electric, electrocuting yourself. We mitigate that risk and we figured out how to do that. So I think that if you can really, really improve the quality of some people's lives and, and, and you know, people who are quadriplegic are often, you know, young, healthy and have a long time ahead of them. And it, it, so it, if, if they've got the potential to have some independence and autonomy, I think that that offers a really, really in powerful, um, positive outcome from that. But you're absolutely right. We don't want companies reading our minds and, uh, you know, and, and using AI to tailor things to, towards our minds and things like that. So I think it's important to um, look at it uh, with uh, cautious optimism is the way I would uh, call it. Sure, sure. You know, another thing that occurs to me is how are uh, the evil people <laughs> going to use this? So like we're talking about Greenpeace in a minute, you know, how would activist groups who are very savvy when it comes to PR how might they use this or how might their their buddies in the in the you know the trial bar association like how might they <laughs> you know it seems like you could use this for all sorts of nefarious purposes like to provoke a negative reaction about a pesticide or a vaccine or like you could do all kinds of stuff with this so all that to say i'm very curious to see where this goes and uh yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a new it's a new frontier yeah okay well pay attention to that i think it's something we'll be talking about a lot in the future 
just because it's it's inevitable. A lot of this tech stuff, one way or another, you're going to have to confront it. You know, it's not going to go away. So that's right. Speaking of evil people, though, <laughs> let's talk about this story from Forbes. This is by an economist named uh, Talak Dashi. I'm almost certainly mispronouncing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's a very excellent story. It's called Rejecting the Luxury Green Beliefs of the Privileged West Why Developing Countries Are Rebelling Against Green Peace's Anti-Technology Policies. So normally I like to summarize these stories without editorializing, but to summarize it, I have to tell you what he said. And he is, <laughs> he's not kind to these people. And it's, it's beautiful. I couldn't have written a better story. But he starts out by pointing out that Russia, of all places, very recently banned Greenpeace. They shut down the Russia branch of Greenpeace. And, you know, for for all of its faults and all of the things that Vladimir Putin has done and will do and does that we all agree are evil, I, I have to say, I kind, of, <laughs> I kind of enjoy this. So the government said the group intervenes in Russia's internal affairs, financially supports foreign agents, and that its activities pose a threat to the foundation of the constitutional system and security of the Russian Federation. Now, I find that hilarious because most of it is correct. In one sense or another, Greenpeace does really awful things. And the, the example that pop, pops to mind for me is that they have gone on to field trials of biotech crops and taken weed whackers to them. Right? Exactly. So destruction of property, just uh, like all sorts of like outright. Imagine, imagine doing a science experiment in your lab at your university yeah. and having somebody disagree with you having transgenic mice right? and then going and taking and feeding rodenticide to your transgenic mice that cost you your whole grant. That's the exact same thing. That's the exact same thing. And mm -hmm. I, it, it's completely unethical. Yeah. And it's not just Greenpeace. There's all kinds of absurd examples. They're, the most recent example is, you know, these, these climate activists destroying priceless art, you know, throwing paint on it. And then Kevin and I discussed an example after the Ukraine war broke out of activist groups dumping grain off of trains that were destined for sub-Saharan Africa, I believe, thinking it was it was GMO corn or something. <laughs> and it turns out it was just wheat, which there is no GMO uh, commercialized variety of that. So all, all kinds of bad stuff. So all that to say, and again, you have to, you have to entertain two thoughts here, right? Russia does bad things, but in this case, I think they have made a sensible <laughs> decision in shutting down the stuff that Greenpeace is doing. So um, the author goes on and he points out that environmental activists here in the United States and Canada, they are all beside themselves. They're very perturbed. This is a violation of free speech and this is autocratic Russia striking again, blah, blah, blah. But he points out that the, they don't just lobby governments. They don't just publish tweets. They don't just write policy papers, but they actually damage property, as I said, but they infiltrate governments and they get into organizations affiliated with the UN and they change policy based on lies. Yep. And, pe and people die as a result of this. And there's a bunch of examples we can talk about. I'm sure you have a lot to say about Sri Lanka. So I'll just leave that there and you can tell me what you think about this. Yeah, I think the most, the, the most egregious example of environmentalism gone wild is, um, uh, and believe me, I think that the environment is critically important. And I do believe that biodiversity and planetary health are should be paramount along with human health. It should, it, we, we all are in this together. So we need it. We have a responsibility to make good decisions for both human health and planetary health. So, so that said, I mean, you know, this is our Garden of Eden. There's not one else, another one out there. We need to make sure we take care of it. But that said, pushing a radical environmental policy that is not based on science actually impacts the people who can least afford it. And Sri Lanka is the case and point for this. So Sri Lanka's had a couple, and people don't, quite understand how fundamental agriculture is to civilization. They think that, oh, you know, food just kind of appears from nowhere. You know, you, it grows on a grocery shelf or, or something like that. Sri Lanka, understand, is a very sophisticated, well-educated nation that was held up as a centerpiece of good 
um, you know, stewardship and uh, an example of how a formerly um, lower income country was able to make its way up to a middle income country and be successful. Now, this is in the, despite 27 years of the Civil War, despite a tidal wave that absolutely uh, destroyed the, the tourist economy and, and things like that. So um, I hear a lot that the, the situation in Sri Lanka is a, a really multifactorial, and we'll get into the beginning of kind of what happened in just a second, but that the tourism industry um, is, is their biggest industry and, and that, you know, the, the, because of the corruption in the country and things like that, that that's why the country has had problems. So once again, there are multiple countries out there that are that have corruption. Um, there and there has been a long-standing um, instability in Sri Lanka, and even despite that, they were able to maintain their status as a middle-income country, educate their population, and have a robust trade system. Right. So, what took that all away? Well, they did a little trial run of. Um, bad agricultural policy in 2015. So in 2015, they decided because of a unfounded claim that glyphosate, um, which is a herbicide, um, w was causing kidney problems in agricultural workers. And so they decided to ban this despite um, the input of many um, scientists who said that this is that there's no association between kidney disease and, and glyphosate. And glyphosate is really fundamental to agriculture. And agriculture for your economy is the biggest driver of the economy. So in fact, the tea trade is the central agricultural centerpiece of um, Sri Lanka. Ceylon tea is one of the most highly sought after types of tea worldwide and they have got great pride in their in the production of that that product um it tea is responsible for 71 percent of um, sri lanka's food imports so the the country is its food security is is tied to this crop and this is according to the uh, food and agriculture organization right so the food security of the country is tied to this crop so in 2015 they decided to unilaterally ban glyphosate um, and that wound up being a huge problem. Why is it a huge problem? Well, Sri Lanka is a tropical island. Um, and when you have a tropical island, you get lush vegetation that likes to grow very quickly into your different plantations. And if you get invasion of the jungle in your tea plantation, it kills your tea trees. And when you get to your tea trees dying um, for, from uh, weed pressure or insect pressure or things like that, you wind up um, having to regrow the whole plantation because, and it takes at least three years to get a product out of your, uh, your new trees. So you can't just, it's not like a row crop where you can just replant the next year and it, you've got, you know, production. This is a whole tree that you've got to grow. So it really devastated the, the uh, tea tree uh, tea, tea plantations productivity. And so what you had was you had this very low toxicity, um, very easy to use, inexpensive, off patent, um, very important herbicide um, that was taken out of um, production. And people were, people were actually importing, you know, things illegally now. They use different herbicides that you don't know what they are. They get them off the black market. So they're exposed to other things that, that might have a higher toxicity profile, one. And two, you then have young Tamil women hand weeding the jungle. Now, I don't know anybody who's all that excited about weeding just in general, but hand weeding the jungle, and I've got photographs of what that looks like um, in, from Indonesia, but hand weeding the jungle is a huge deal because why? What's in the jungle? Snakes. And they're not wussy snakes like our snakes. We've got rattlesnakes and copperheads in the United States, and there are approximately 12 snake bite, bite deaths in the United States every year, even though we've got tons of snakes. So very low these, these, these snakes aren't that bad in terms of causing mortality and morbidity. In Sri Lanka, on the other hand, you have crates and cobras, which have an incredible mortality associated with it. So young people hand-weeding the jungle all of a sudden are at risk of snake bite. 
And the World Health Organization said in 2017 that snake bite was one of the leading neglected causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide, and it needed to be addressed. They're actually funding snake bite prevention research. And who does it affect? It affects agricultural workers who can least afford to, to be sick or die from snake bite. Because once again, you get young, healthy people with young children. Um, and when they die, they uh, get put into a cycle of poverty. Anyway, the, the economic impact of this glyphosate ban in 2015 was so profound that they actually wound up reversing it because they realized that it was impacting their economy. Um, people were refusing to go work in um, the tea plantations for fear of snake bite. There are newspaper reports of that um, coming out of Sri Lanka around that time. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a big deal. Shortly thereafter, persuaded by lots of people who don't actually go hungry um, and lots of people who are the beneficiaries of fantastically efficient agriculture and food security, were talking about how important it was to go all organic, so to, to protect mother nature, to protect human health, and there was a lot of lobbying from a very many activists who actually make a lot of money traveling around um, and, and lecturing on these kinds of uh, uh, policies. Go all organic and things like that. Once again, I don't have a problem with organic farming. It just doesn't, re it, we've done it for 10,000 years and it doesn't reliably feed people. So telling a nation and pressuring a nation to go all organic in one fell swoop by banning fertilizer and by banning agrochemicals puts that population at incredible risk, especially when their food supply is dependent on a cash crop, right? So, so overnight in, uh, I guess it was, must have been April of 2019 or 2020, I can't remember the exact year, I think it was 2020, April of 2020, um, the government decided we're going to ban fertilizer and we're going to ban um agrochemicals, despite the input, again, of scientists and people who had lived through this little run-up experiment with the glyphosate. And they said, no problem, no, ma no matter, we're, gonna, we're getting rid of it. We're getting rid of all chemicals and firing. Mm -hmm. And the tea plantations collapsed. The, um, their, their economy then very quickly collapsed. They haven't been able to afford food. They haven't been able to afford energy. They haven't been able to. They haven't been able to get medical care. Um, it's 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 a it, it's evident. This is clear evidence based outcome of bad agricultural policy, and we've seen this through the centuries. Um, when we talk about bad uh, agricultural policies um, really having a negative impact on people. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, you know, when Trofim Lysenko was the um, agricultural minister of Russia, so going back to Russia, right, agricultural minister of Russia, he did not believe in genetics. And so he fabricated research um, that, 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 that he said he could go grow crops in, in, you know, ridiculous conditions that he could, but if you crossed him, you were sent to the gulag. And so what, what came out of Trofim Lysenko's, uh, agricultural policy that was based on falsified science, not, 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 whoops, I made a mistake science based on science that was actually wrong. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 politicized and pushed. Um, what happened was you had the Holodomor in the late 20s, early 30s in, in, in Ukraine. So mass starvation in Ukraine, starvation across the Soviet Union, uh, food shortages across the Soviet Union. And he was so persuasive with his disinformation that he actually promoted it to Mao in the 50s during the Great Leap Forward and another 50 million people starved to death. So we have repeated uh, this uh, trial with a huge, huge impact on very susceptible populations over and over and over again. And in medicine, we like to you know, preach, we like to preach about evidence-based medicine and basing your, you know, uh, your, what you do or what drugs you give or, you know, how you practice 
on the outcome of randomized double blind controlled trials. Um, and those are, those are considered gold standard. Well, we have gold standard trials of what happens when you get, do promote poor agricultural policy. And, and I think we've got three clear instances, both two of them in the 20th century, one in the 21st century. And I think it's absolutely unethical for us to be promoting or, or any of these NGOs to be promoting this kind of um, policy because it puts huge populations at risk. Let's deal with this idea that, uh, you know, this was multifactorial and, uh, you know, you can't blame organic agriculture. You can't blame one factor because this was the, this was the anti-GMO apology. So, you know, like their defense of why they weren't to blame for this. That was part of the argument was that, well, it's more complicated than that. So here are a couple of facts to keep in mind. Like most places, farmers in Sri Lanka, about 90% of them roughly use the synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that were banned by the government. As a result of that, they did not have the inputs they needed to work their land. So fully a third of the country's agricultural land just laid fallow for, for the season. So the result, of course, uh, was food shortages, and that resulted in massive price increases. Now, common sense and basic economics would tell you that you need to reverse that policy right away because you're you're now facing severe food shortages, or at least your 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 people are. People are. The president did not go hungry. I'm almost certain that is until they kicked him out of the country. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah, I, sorry, this gets me really upset. But basically. After all this happened, the government said, well, we're going to put price controls on food because the rich people are hoarding it. So they they hired or they they promoted a general and they made him, uh, you know, commissar of food. Like gave, they gave him some bureaucratic title, but they blamed it on people who were hoarding food. In reality, the people are hoarding food because there's not enough of it to go around. Right. So then they put in price controls and that exacerbated the shortages again, as economics would tell you. Okay, so the, so the point is, and not to belabor it, the point is these are, these are outcomes tied very specifically to agricultural policy. And then it bleeds into the rest of the, of the economy because, as you said, I believe it's tea, rubber, and rice are their major exports. Yep. All, yep. Of, all of those were decimated by the policies that we've talked about here, right? So if they can't export stuff, they can't import stuff from the countries they buy from. And then everyone's incomes fall. And it ripples throughout the entire society and people get so pissed off, they burn down the prime minister's house and they go swimming in the president's pool until he leaves the country. So this is just, this is pure evil. And one final thing I'll say that it was the soil association in the UK. They came out on Twitter and they said, you know, okay, look, this is obviously bad, but nobody in the organic community says you should have switched overnight the way they did. Right. This needed to be a long-term process. It's not organic farming's fault. And I wrote an article about this for ACSH. It's called Anti-GMO Groups Deflect Blame for Sri Lanka's Organic Only Disaster. I encourage you to read that and look at the, the tweets in there because just a couple of months before things really nosedived in Sri Lanka, the Soil Association hosted Vandana Shiva at one of their conferences. And Shiva was the rock star activist who the Sri Lankan government was listening to. So in other words, just months before everything collapsed and people started to suffer very severely, these clowns were celebrating the woman who told them to do it. So, right, so after everything went to pot, they were all of a sudden going, whoa, 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 like slow down. We didn't tell you to do that. But she applauded. You know. There is there is YouTube video footage of her applauding Sri Lanka for taking this step and saying that it that 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 uh agriculture is modern agriculture is somehow sinful um and, and it's it's become a religion for for some people mm-hmm. and it, it's those people aren't hungry she gets flown all over the world to speak at top tier universities about these policies and if if you you as a physician i took an oath and that oath is to 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 support the idea of first do no harm and this has caused an incredible amount of harm to millions of people and it's 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 mind-boggling to me that 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 this can actually happen in the 21st century with all of the scientific knowledge 
that we have at our fingertips that overnight you can have somebody change the, the perception of the general population and put put so much um, pseudoscience out there uh, that that you would actually make people starve. And of course, it's not your children who are starving, right? So that, that that's that's that that's the problem. You've got you've got Western colonialist type people who are who are promoting a policy that does not work for the rest of the world. For example, they say, you know, you shouldn't be using pesticides um, in parts of the world um, that are not used in Europe. Well, Europe has the best pesticide in the world. It's called winter. And so there's not 24-7, 365 insect pressure that is, that is, uh, that's going on. So you need, to, you can't just use, you know, you can't just use one product um, for insects that are that are you know there that you got the pressure there all the time. You got to you you got to be smart about it. You have got to use integrated pest uh, you know pest management. You have got to use different techniques and different products and things like that and put them together. And then before you know it, you have very productive agriculture and people are fed. So we take that for granted in the West. And I think a lot of people mean well, um, but this is what's this is the outcome and it's not a good outcome. And they wouldn't, I wouldn't want it for my children and we shouldn't inflict it on their children. No, uh, here's one more example. This is uh, from Dashi's article. He points out that in India, Greenpeace lobbied the government to ban nuclear power. They, they at least until recently, they continued to lobby against uh, coal fired power plants and coal production or coal mining. And they made a big PR stunt out of this by giving a solar a solar grid, a solar panels to a small village in India. And they said, look, you don't need this dirty coal. And then when people started hooking up to this solar grid, the power was inconsistent. It failed, right? It wouldn't power their air conditioners and, the, and it wouldn't power their electricity. Like the basic things that you take for granted, you flip on a light switch or you turn on your AC and it just works. Or you keep your loved one on a ventilator yes. and you're not, and you're not hand pumping the ventilator, switching off with your family every, it, because the electricity is there, mm -hmm. right? And people don't understand that electricity doesn't come out of the clear blue sky. And once again, it, it, if you're going to take away reliable sources of electricity without a good backup, mm -hmm. you, the, the people who can at least, who can least afford it, mm -hmm. um, and the least, they've got the least wiggle room, they've got the least... They're, they're the ones who are the most heavily impacted. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's pretty easy to understand this. And again, there's a risk here that I'm going to be called a climate change denier. I'm not. Climate change I'm is not. real. We contribute yep. to it. It can be bad. There you go. There's your disclaimer. Nevertheless, yep. where I'm in California in the next couple of months, it gets to 105, 110 degrees in, in, in July and August. It's unbearable. The only reason that there's a thriving city where I'm at is because of a plentiful water and air conditioning. That's it. There would be nobody here because we would all die. And so if the choice is between, you know, an inconsistent solar powered energy system or consistent. Nuclear? Yeah. Nuclear. I, again, again, <laughs> there's there, the right. There's lots of activism against nuclear from the same from Greenpeace and these other groups. But if the choice is between, you know, I need to use nuclear power or fossil fuel to get energy to keep my house cool for my pregnant wife, you can bet your ass which choice I'm going to make. And every parent is going to do the same thing. So let me just put this out. This is a quote from the article, and then I'll stop talking. <laughs> Dashi says, the agenda of Western environmental NGOs is in no uncertain terms a left-wing one. It demands radical changes in individual and social behavior. Such preferred changes are in keeping with the concept of sustainable development, <laughs> a nebulous concept dreamed up by the luxury beliefs of privileged intellectuals in the developed West. So again, it's, it's poetry, right? Beautiful words. But he's just saying these people are not reaping what they're selling. They're not living their commitments. And to be clear, I think the, the sustainable development goals are noble goals. The mechanism by which they're getting there is actually not correct, though. Yeah. I believe in zero hunger. I believe in, you know, equality. I believe in, you know, clean water and all of that stuff. We, we 
want, we have the same goals, but the policies that are being uh, driven by organizations like Greenpeace are not based in science in reality. And you've got, if you, hungry people are not good stewards of the environment. And so you, you've got to really be very thoughtful about the policies that you make, um, not sitting from your position of privilege in, in, in an ivory tower somewhere, but understanding that well, we've got this romantic notion about subsistence farming and none of us sub subsistence farm. I mean, we have a hard time growing a little vegetable patch in our backyard. So if you're thinking you're going to feed a whole nation like that, or in, 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 in if the agriculture completely collapses, they're going to come get your vegetable yard pretty quickly. Right. <laughs> so I, we've got to, we've got to have a more common sense environmental policy or it, it, environmental policy and agricultural policy is just because you don't want to harm the earth and you don't want to harm people. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem. It gets to, I guess what fundamentally is an ideological disagreement because it's not just the outcome. That's how they sell their policies to you because they know everybody likes clean air and clean water and a livable planet. Those are e easy sales points. Everybody agrees on them. But as you said, it's how you get to those and what they're, what they're really after and not to be conspiratorial here, but you can just go read their literature. They're after a lower global population. They're after a reduction in technology. It's right. Degrowth is the fancy, sexy marketing term for it. It sounds, oh, degrowth. That sounds cool. Like we're just, yeah. you, right. <laughs> All it means is, you know, turn your lights off and turn your AC off, eat less food and have less, med like it just means less of what you need as a society to thrive. And that sucks. I don't want that. <laughs> and well, and and the people who have wealth are able to 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 absorb some of that, right? And they don't usually do it themselves. I mean, if you look at if you look at some of our politicians who are uh, touting climate change policy that, that you know fly in their private jets all the time. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. You know, well, I need to fly in my private jet. Right. Why do you, why do you need to fly in your private jet if, if you're expecting you, you know everybody else to? ride their bikes mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean that's that's not yeah that's not yeah that's not fair it's yeah, it, and it's it's hypocrisy it's corruption and let me just this is just a little fun fact that i think I think everybody knows it. You just, it doesn't just occur to you is that, and I sort of alluded to it a minute ago, is that the weather has always killed people. <laughs> yes, you, can, it does. You, can, you can do this test, right? Would you rather live in Minnesota in the 1500s or Phoenix, Arizona today? Right? The answer to most people, I think, unless you're insane or you're, you're an adrenaline junkie, is, well, I want to be in Arizona because. Unless Unless you like, like, or like Matt Mallory and want to be on top of Everest all the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Like I said, unless you're insane or you're an adrenaline, <laughs> yeah. junk, right? So my yeah. point is, is like the weather has always been harmful. I think part of the problem in the discussions about climate change is that there is no nuance, right? Mm -hmm. It's right, unprecedented changes. It's hotter. There's more storms. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. The reality is, is that the weather has always been a very serious threat. And interestingly enough, um cold right it's the mm -hmm. fact that we can manipulate our environments yep. that keeps us alive so just don't lose sight of that climate change is important but in context please is all yes I agree. all right better news though let's not end on a negative note like we have to so many times uh let's talk about discovering new antibiotics and this i think is this might be my favorite application of ai that i've heard about so far because mm -hmm. it seems like the one that's least likely to be abused by bad people but <laughs> yeah this is a story from the BBC by James Gallagher. It's called AI Helps Discover New Drug That Kills Antibiotic Resistant Superbug. So this, I, I will need you to fill in the gaps for me. But the basic idea is that when you're trying to figure or trying to identify new antibiotics, you just have to test different drugs and go, does this work? No. Does this work? No. Wash, rinse, repeat. So with AI, you can, you can tell AI this is what kills super or, or what kills uh bacteria and then with that info it can go scan thousands of pieces of data about all sorts of drugs it can basically do what scientists do but but on an unprecedented scale and so this the study that is the subject of this article was published in nature chemical biology and i think they went through almost seven thousand compounds and they identified one <laughs> that effectively killed 
Um, I forget the species. You can you can talk about that. I but, can't remember. I've got to look and see what the, the exact which one it was. Yeah. So it's while you, while you looked it up, it might be an actinobacter. I, I, I've got to look. Yeah, you can look that up. But basically, they found this drug, and at least in the laboratory, it killed this bacteria, this bacteria. And I believe they actually took samples from people that had been infected with this, and it worked. So there's a, still a lot of research to do. It has to go through clinical trials. I think one of the researchers involved said it, it might be 2030, possibly, before this is actually able to be prescribed. But this is a big deal, and I'm sure many of you have had bacterial infections. I had one a few years ago. It was an upper respiratory tract infection. It was as miserable as I've ever been. I thought it was a canker, thought it was a canker sore at first because it was in the back of my throat. I'm like, I get those all the time, but your throat starts to swell up. You can't swallow. I'm like, oh, this is bad, <laughs> you know. But I was able to go to the doctor. They gave me a shot of antibiotics. They gave me a painkiller. A couple of days, yeah. good as new, right? <laughs> Thank God it wasn't one of these things that's hard to control with drugs, but I, I forget the statistic. It's, it's, I think it's like 2 million people globally die every year because they have infections that cannot be treated with antibiotics. Or multi drug resistant. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. And, and that's a big, huge problem. And so it, it, the, the drug, the, the multi drug resistant bugs that we hear about here a lot in the United States are MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus um, and, and um, things like that. So they have, we knew about drug resistance and um, antibiotic resistance early on when people started getting treated with penicillin for everything. So penicillin was the first sort of discovery, and that was an accidental discovery when Alexander uh, Fleming left his Petri dish um, out overnight and came back and realized there was a fungus in there growing and there was no bacteria growing around it. It's like, oh my goodness, that's pretty crazy. Maybe there's something being secreted by this fungal fungal infection that that is killing bacteria. And maybe we can use that to kill um, bacteria that cause infections in people. And so it was one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. It's one of the it, one of the cornerstones of public health is the discovery of antibiotics. So penicillin very was hard to um, it was hard to scale up production of penicillin. Um, and so uh, it wasn't until the 40s and even into the 50s before people were able to get high enough doses of pen, or you know a big enough uh, uh, supply of penicillin to be using it a lot. And quickly things began to get um, resistant to it. So we see that with lots of different diseases. We see that with HIV, with multi-drug resistance. That's why we use different different um, uh, uh, the pharmaceuticals to antivirals to treat HIV. And now that's become a, a disease of, you know, a chronic disease rather than a disease that was going to kill people in two years. Same kind of principle with, um, with antibiotics. Now, the problem with antibiotics is that um, they don't, um, they're not very, it costs a lot of money to develop an antibiotic. Um, and it, it, it doesn't, those, those antibiotics are not used frequently enough. The novel new ones are not used frequently enough to be able to recoup some of that money. Um, and so it's very hard to get um, companies to focus on antibiotics, just like it's hard to get companies to focus on va vaccines too. Um, and that, that, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there in terms of moral kind of issues. I, I think that I, I wish that companies could work for free on a lot of these things. Um, but one of the ways to, but, but companies have to make enough money to be able to um, finance more research and development and things like that. So one of the ways to do that is to make it easier and less expensive to do that R&D. So if you are going to have one drug, you have to, you, you, go through in silico and computers and things like that. We look um, very closely at a lot of other different compounds that might have the same structure that show some promise. We, and you'll look at the thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals, right? And then you will go through this arduous process of testing um, in, in uh, petri dishes, then in animals, then people. And all of this take, this process takes um, you know, 10, 15 years to do and cost billions of dollars. So a, a university might come up with a really wonderful, 
product, what looks like a really wonderful chemical compound that in the in a petri dish and pilot studies looks like it's a, a productive, but they it won't be able to afford to do all of the work that's needed to get the product from the bench to the bedside. It would bankrupt the, the university to, to do that with more than one or two products, right? Mm. So that's not what universities are built for. That's what co companies are built for. And if you can make that process more efficient and less time and less costly, you can actually bring down your prices of drugs and you can get you you companies can afford to start looking at novel antibiotics. And that's where this is really, really important. You can very rapidly screen and find compounds that um that can treat multi-drug resistant um uh, and cut out a huge amount of time and money um to get this on the market quicker um, and to out to benefit more people. So I think this is very promising technology um, and I'm pretty excited about it. It's really, really cool. There's a, this is from the paper itself, but they talk about how this drug is particularly useful or could be particularly useful because it targets one bacteria. Yes. So like you said with penicillin, you just kind of threw, it's like shit against the wall. Just like, yeah, it works. It works. Right? right. Yeah. So that contributes to the resistance issue. It's sort of the same thing with pesticides too that we've talked about before. Yeah. What they, they talk about here, it's species selective antibiotics. And apparently, the, and explain this if you're able to, but they talk mm -hmm. about um, horizontal dissemination of resistance determinants. So I think this is bacteria swapping genes that make Jeans, them. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if it's a targeted drug, in other words, there's no, I guess, evolutionarily, there's no reason why other species of bacteria would go, oh, I'm going to take that. That'd be useful, right? And it depends. I think, it depends I, if that gets into a plasmid, which is like a little circular piece okay, of DNA right. gets moved over or, you know, those kinds of things. So it depends. You wouldn't want to use the same antibiotic over and over and over and over and over and over again um, because you can breed uh, that's how you have the pressure to develop resistance, right? So this can be targeted, but you can also probably tweak it just like you can tweak BT, right? So you can tweak, um, you know, in, in GMO crops, you can, you can, you can target very specific insects, right? Um, and instead of all the ladybugs and all the butterflies and things like that, you can, you can tailor your, your uh, crop to, to target a specific, specific bug this is the same kind of thing you could tweak it as you went along to target very specific um specific uh, uh bugs i got you sure. okay so that i mean so that's really cool too it's not just that they're discovering new drugs that may work against some species somewhere they're saying oh no it works against this one which yep. we can't treat right now or it's really hard to treat or whatever it is yes so this is great. This is great. And just seeing how things progress, it seems like this hopefully will snowball, right? More people will, will more people will read this paper and go, hey, let's let's do the same thing or let's accelerate what we're doing. I think even Kevin was saying at his lab at the University of Florida, they do this with plant stuff. <laughs> they just yeah. throw chemicals at weeds and they're like, maybe this could be a drug. Maybe, maybe this could work. Yeah. Maybe this will work. Yes. And that's and when you do that, it's a long, arduous, expensive process. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got this part done ahead of time, you can really, really cut some of that uh, unnecessary testing out. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, as you go into your weekend, there's some good news for you that maybe by the time your kids are older, they'll have, <laughs> they'll have more antibiotics, Fingers right? Crossed. Right. Fingers yeah. crossed. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to leave it there for, for this time. We'll be back next week with 222. Until then, follow us on Twitter at Dr. Liza Dunn at Cam J English, at Genetic Literacy Project. Please uh, give us your questions, your comments. We had a reader interact with us on Twitter. Thank you very yeah. much. I won't say who it was, but thank you for your comments. We appreciate we it. Welcome yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'd love to talk about the show. If you, uh, if you want to argue or just say hi, either one's fine. Yeah. So with that, have a lovely week and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.